Okay, good evening. <clears throat> I'm Wendy Warren, Director of Education at Holocaust Museum Houston. Welcome to the Warren and Specter Warren Fellowship for Future Teachers Public Lecture. For their support of these fellowships, Holocaust Museum Houston would like to thank the Naomi and Martin Warren Family Foundation, the Warren Fellowship Endowment Fund, the Solomon Specter Foundation, and the Bear Sons Family Foundation. For tonight's lecture, please post your questions in the Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. We will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the lecture. Tonight's lecture titled Understanding and Responding to Antisemitism is presented by Dr. Robert Williams. Dr. Williams is Deputy Director for Internal, International Affairs at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum on the steering committee of the Global Task Force on Holocaust Distortion and served for four years as chair of the Committee on Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial at the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. He regularly advises international organizations and governments on anti-Semitism and Holocaust issues. And he is currently overseeing a major initiative that assesses European Holocaust and genocide denial laws. Robert's research specialties include German history, US and Russian foreign policy, propaganda and disinformation, and contemporary anti-Semitism. Outside of work, he is co-editing a volume for Rutledge on the history of anti-Semitism. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Williams. Thank you for having me, Wendy, and apologies if you hear a dog in the background while I pull up my presentation. Um, before I begin, I really want to start by not only thanking you, Wendy, but also Dr. Kelly Zuniga of the Holocaust Museum Houston, uh, the Warren and Specter families for their support for this important fellowship program, and to the Warren and Specter fellows themselves. I think this is an important program and, and I'm very happy to play a small role in, in contributing to it. So, my goal this evening is to give you a somewhat broad overview of the contours of anti-Semitism and the many forms that it takes today. But over the course of the week since I initially wrote this lecture, we've been confronted with images like these. So over just the two, past two weeks, we've seen a rising tide of anti-Semitism that's been troubling. And the forms of anti-Semitism expressed over this brief period, or I think more appropriately, the press coverage thereof, has been of the type that appears only through certain forms of criticism of events in the Middle East. But these are not the only ways that anti-Semitism appears. So what I'm going to do is speak for about 40 minutes on this topic, followed by an opportunity for some questions. I'm going to warn you at the front that some, if not most of what I'm going to say is disturbing and upsetting. But if nothing else, I want you to walk away from our discussion remembering a few key things. First. Anti-Semitism is a growing, adaptable, and persistent form of hatred. It's not particular to any one culture or any one religion. It has multiple influences that include, but are not limited to, religious bias, white nationalism, neo-Nazism, fascism, uh, communism, populism, anti-Zionism, anti-globalism, extreme forms of Islamist ideology, which is different from Islam as a faith, post-colonialism, anti-Americanism, and conspiracy thinking. Third, anti-Semitism and the related phenomena of Holocaust denial and Holocaust distortion are threats to our core institutions, to our shared international beliefs, and to our democratic way of life. But most important of all, I want you to remember that anti-Semitism is a belief system. And like any belief, it can be changed but it will take time. Now, we don't have time for a continent by continent overview of the problem. So let's focus primarily on two regions where anti-Semitism is most acute these days, Europe and North America. We're gonna begin in Europe because after all, anti-Semitism started in Europe. It spread throughout the world through European programs of expansion, the Crusades, the colonial era, et cetera. And it's in Europe that anti-Semitism reached its most violent ends during the Holocaust. European anti-Semitism is a particular challenge. It did not disappear with the end of the Second World War. 
It remained, becoming more acute from time to time over the course of the Cold War, particularly in the official policies of the Soviet Union. And it's become an all too obvious threat over the last few years. A number of e recent EU surveys demonstrate a very sad day-to-day -day reality. 89% of Jews in the EU know that anti-Semitism has increased in their countries. 20% have family members or friends who have been the victims of verbal or physical assaults. And most disturbing, a significant majority, about 80%, 79.2% if you wanna be precise, don't go to the police in the first place to report anti-Semitic crimes, more often than not because they think it's pointless to do so. Police statistics themselves are even more disheartening. If you take the years between 2009 and 2019, you'll see that anti-Semitism did decline in some countries. These countries include Belgium, France, Hungary, and Poland. Although it's difficult to make this claim for Hungary and Poland because they changed the way they report hate crimes over the, uh, the last few years. But in most cases, official rates of anti-Semitism increased during that decade. Sometimes the upward swing was relatively modest. In Sweden, it rose by 11%. In Germany, by about 20%. And in other countries, the trajectory was well, in Austria, it rose by 150%, in Greece by 100%, and then Denmark, strikingly, 292% between 2009 and 2019, with a 96% increase between 2018 and 2019. And indicators from this year and late last year are also disturbing. The German government recently reported 2,275 reported anti-Semitic incidents in Germany over the course of 2020. 55 of these were violent acts. This was an increase of 12% since 2019. And that's just the tip of the iceberg because as anyone who tracks hate crimes will tell you, statistics underrepresent the scale of the problem. This is due to the different ways that police, the judiciary, governments, and others report these crimes. And after all, at least in the European context, remember close to 80% of these crimes aren't reported in the first place. Now. There is some hope. These disturbing trends are prompting action in Europe. In the coming months, the European Union will announce a comprehensive strategy to tackle anti Semitism within EU member countries. And a number of European countries, inside and outside of the EU, are devising national strategies to address anti Semitism. One of the stronger of these plans can actually be found in Norway, for example. But we're not immune to this. And yes, Historically, the United States did avoid a lot of the violent anti-Semitism that's been found in European history. There were a few major events. In 1862, in my home state of Kentucky, General Grant tried to expel Jews from parts of the state. In 1915, a man by the name of Leo Frank was lynched in Marietta, Georgia. At the height of the scourge of lynchings that claimed the lives of thousands of African Americans and hundreds of other ethnic groups in our country. But by and large, violent anti-Semitism has been rare. This situation has also changed. Today, we witness a growing number of violent attacks on Jewish communities across the US, something that really began with the Overland Park, Kansas shootings in 2014. In 2019, crimes against Jews represented 60.2% of all religious-based hate crimes, which is how the FBI classifies anti-Semitism. This was an increase of 14% since 2018, the year of the 11 murders at the Tree of Life Synagogue. And even still, the problem's likely worse. Although American Jewish communities generally have a more, well, healthier relationship with the police, of the 15,588 law enforcement agencies that report data to the FBI, only 2,172 reported hate crime incidents of all types. And there are a number of rising factors <clears throat> behind the rise of anti-Semitism, both in North America and Europe. These include more hate speech and a growth in the number of hate groups. In terms of hate speech, organizations like the Anti-Defamation League have reported a significant increase in the amount of white supremacist propaganda that appeared in 2020. There were 5,125 reported cases, which was nearly double the number of cases from 2019. And of these, 283 specifically targeted Jews. This anti Semitic rhetoric represents an almost 70% increase since 2019. 
And this is being felt by Jewish communities across the states. As reported in a recent ADL poll, 63% of American Jews report hearing or experiencing anti-Semitic comments over the past year. But we also see this on the other side of the Atlantic. And there are some shared factors as well. These might include declines in public faith in the value of democracies, something for which there are strong indicators of dips ever since the financial crisis in the first decade of this century. There's also the rise of a new media landscape, one characterized by a constant bombardment of often superficial and hyperbolic information. And we should take into account changing educational norms and a drift away from learning core subjects that can lead to mutual understanding. This includes subjects like the Holocaust, of course, but also basic lessons in civics, governance, and democratic values. An additional factor behind the rise of anti-Semitism is also the popularity of conspiracy theories. And I wanna dive into this a bit. So what's a conspiracy? There are complex academic explanations to this uh, question, but more often than not, in the real world, a conspiracy is an attempt to blame a mysterious force, a conspiracy theory rather, is an attempt to blame a mysterious force for major events, present day ills, or just when things don't feel right. And this, this can be, oops, sorry. This can be tricky because there are real conspiracies. Sometimes real conspiracies can be innocent, like if your friends plan a surprise party for you. Other times they might be a petty crime. Think of a bank heist in this case. They can also be organized by governments and other authorities. So for example, in 1932, the US government's public health service collaborated with the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama to study syphilis rates in the African-American community. This study included 600 men, 399 of whom had syphilis, and they were all promised that they would receive the most up-to-date medical treatments for this disease, but they didn't. No one received treatment because the secret goal of this study was to see what would happen if people were not treated. And what happened in the end is that many of the sick died, 40 of their wives caught the disease, and at least 19 children were born with congenital syphilis. This was a conspiracy organized by a small group, and that's key. Real conspiracies are organized by small groups, small groups that maintain secrecy and leave behind enough evidence so we can prove their actions, unfortunately, more often than not after the fact. But there are also conspiracy theories or better still conspiracy myths that are outright false. Some are created on a lark, sometimes out of a sense that there's a need to explain something complicated and others are just designed to cast blame on groups. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories take on many forms. One of the earliest is the so-called blood libel, namely the notion that Jews would murder an innocent Christian child in order to use her or his blood for the preparation of matzah, typically around Passover. There might be ancient Roman inspirations for this tale, but the conspiracy myth really emerged in 12th century England based around the myths surrounding the death of St. William of Norwich, but forms of this conspiracy theory can still be seen today. A more modern conspiracy theory has also proven influential, the so-called Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This was a fake book invented by the Russian Tsar's intelligence services in the early 20th century. It pretends to be the plans of a secret cabal of Jews who are trying to steer the world behind the scenes to bend it to their will. The Protocols continues to be influential on a global scale more often than not because it has the support of elites. In the United States, it spread very quickly in the 1920s, thanks in large part to people like Henry Ford, whose personal newspaper republished this tract. And today we have our own new conspiracies. Some like the so-called great replacement conspiracy theory, which is a French derived conspiracy that claims that Jews are trying to undermine Western civilization by promoting the immigration of non-whites into Europe or North America are obviously anti-Semitic. But other conspiracy myths might not seem anti-Semitic, at least at first glance. So take QAnon, which has gained influence since it first emerged online in 2017. As researchers at the British charity Hope Not Hate have noted, QAnon is a super conspiracy. Essentially, it allows those who follow it to contribute other conspiracies and inane thoughts, <clears throat> inane thoughts into this overall conspiracy theory. But the core of the QAnon conspiracy is that there is a secret war against bad forces, coastal elites, Hollywood, so on and so forth, 
who are trying to take over the world and in doing so, kidnap, abuse, and slaughter children in order to gain power from their blood. Is this starting to sound familiar? Because there are clear parallels already with the blood Bible. And over the past couple of years, QAnon has expanded to include a focus on prominent Jewish families and philanthropists, such as George Soros and the Rothschilds, as well as non-Jews. In short, the QAnon conspiracy has become inextricably enmeshed with older anti-Semitic themes. And more troubling on a global scale, although it was once confined to the US, it's become a bit of an export during the COVID pandemic. And QAnon itself is now seen in countries that include Germany. The picture on the bottom right is from a, uh, a QAnon rally in Berlin from last August. It's also seen in parts of the former Yugoslavia, in France, in the UK, especially in the UK, and now outside of Europe in countries like Japan. Why does this happen? Well, anti-Semitic conspiracies are able to adapt to local conditions and situations. You take a bit of an old bias, add it to a new one, mix in some faith and a belief that there's an answer to every question, and you have a conspiracy. But more frightening than that, you have the development of a community built around these conspiracies. Let's look at this in action for a moment. What's happened during the COVID pandemic? Well, in addition to the clear rise of racism directed against persons of Asian descent, we can say with certainty that there are at least eight COVID-informed anti-Semitic conspiracy myths. These include claims that Jews created the virus, are responsible for its spread, profit from COVID-19, enjoy the deaths of non-Jews. There are people who claim that the pandemic disproves the reality of the Holocaust. There are religious leaders of all stripes who claim that the pandemic is God's punishment for Jews. Now that we have vaccines, people are saying that Jews are using the vaccines as a mechanism of control. And of course, as we know all too well, there are those who are misusing imagery and themes from the Holocaust in order to protest pandemic responses. Again, from a different rally in Germany on the top left, we have a uh, yellow star of David, something associated often with the Holocaust. Uh, in the middle, it says ungeimpft, which is the German word for unvaccinated. And it's hard to predict what all of this will mean. The fact of the pandemic means we may likely experience a slight decline in the number of physical anti-Semitic attacks just due to the reality of lockdowns. But multiple organizations are already reporting significant increases in online anti-Semitism. And since words can lead to action, we need to monitor this closely. It's also report, important to remember that most anti-Semites don't restrict their hate to Jews. In Europe, for example, we see anti-Semitic themes applied to Roma populations and to Muslim groups. And this does not mean that anti-Roma racism or Islamophobia are the same as anti-Semitism. Each one has its own context, its own history, and its own features. But here, for example, on the left side of the screen, we have a cover from a Nazi publication in the 1930s in which there's an anti-Semitic caricature of a Jew about to attack a blonde German woman. To the right, the cover of a 2016 magazine from Poland. Here we have another blonde woman, this time draped in the EU flag. She's being attacked by men with brown skin. And the cover says the Islamic rape of Europe. Different targets, different contexts, but similar expressions of hatred. So we now have a sense of some of the ways that anti Semitism affects day to day life, but do we know what anti Semitism is? Yeah, I agree. This is probably an odd question to ask. Surely we know anti Semitism when we see it. And historically, most people have employed this approach to attack the issue. After all, if it looks like a duck and sounds like a duck, you know. But unfortunately, this approach is not precise enough, especially for the vast majority of people who either don't think of anti-Semitism or don't even know what the concept is. Therefore, a few years ago, the committee that I used to lead at the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, which is a 34-nation international organization of diplomats and subject matter experts, it passed a non-legally binding working definition of anti-Semitism. And as of today, the definition has been adopted or endorsed by more than 30 governments, including two Muslim majority countries, Kosovo and Albania, as well as received positive reference by the European Union, the European Parliament, the Secretary General of the UN, 
and it's been adopted by a number of businesses and sports leagues like the uh, uh, Bundesliga and, and uh, the FA in Britain. And in the US, three successive presidential administrations, including the Biden administration, have used and endorsed the adoption of the definition for the purposes of tracking and responding to anti-Semitism in all of its forms. So what does the definition say? At its core, it says that anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property, toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. And I want you to look at this for a moment because what does it not say? It does not say who's an anti-Semite. It doesn't even say who's a Jew. And perhaps most important of all, it does not impugn a motive behind anti-Semitism. Instead, it says that anti-Semitism appears in certain ways. This allows you to start a conversation, to say to somebody, hey, do you know that might be anti-Semitic? So that you can discuss it instead of accusing somebody. Now, by itself, this definition is admittedly somewhat broad. Therefore, the definition itself includes 11 examples of some of the ways that we see anti-Semitism. Each of these examples was the product of intense dialogue and agreement between groups of experts and diplomats from around the world. We're not gonna go into all 11 examples. Nobody has time for that, but let's at least look at a few. One form is accusing Jews as a people for real or imagined wrongdoings, including actions committed by Jewish or non-Jewish individuals. So here we have a photograph of 17-year-old Herschel Grinchpan. It's taken in November, after November 1938. At the time, Grinchpan was one of approximately 50,000 refugees who fled Nazi Germany for France. In 1938, he received word that German authorities had deported his Polish-born parents back to Poland. Angry and alone in a country where he was not welcome, he decided to commit a crime. He went to the German embassy in Paris and assassinated a diplomat, a diplomat named Ernst von Rott. Now, the Nazis used this crime as a pretext to launch the Kristallnacht pogrom of 9 to 10 November 1938. Let's think about this for a moment. Would the Nazis have carried out violence against Jews without the excuse of Grinchbond's actions? Without a doubt. But by casting blame upon all Jews for the actions of an individual, they were able to build some degree of popular support and notional justification for a series of violent actions that took place across greater Germany that November. Here we have another example, calling for the murder of Jews in service to an extreme ideology. And one sees this spanning the spectrum of ideologies, including those that are opposed to one another. Everything from the far right, uh, far right neo-Nazi groups to Hezbollah and all manner of extremisms in between. This is probably what most of us think about when we hear the word anti-Semitism. Now, some of the forms we're gonna talk about next are less obvious. I say this now to point out that anti-Semitism is not always clear cut. The IRA definition, however, can point to areas where it might exist. This is a fancy way of me saying context matters because definitions like this aren't perfect tools that allow us to di diagnose every case of anti-Semitism, but it can point the way. So let's look at some of the ways that anti-Israel criticism can at times mask anti-Semitism. I wanna be clear, nobody is saying that you cannot criticize Israel. The IRA working definition states quite clearly, quote, criticism of Israel, similar to that leveled against any other country cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. But sometimes criticism crosses an anti-Semitic line. Let's take this photograph. This is the synagogue in Wuppertal, Germany. In 2014, it was the object of a firebombing attack. The arsonists behind this attack claimed they were protesting Israeli policies in Gaza, but they did not attack an Israeli institution like a consulate or an embassy. They attacked a local Jewish institution. This is because they conflated all Jews with Israel and then decided to attack. We've seen somewhat similar manifestations of anti-Semitism over the past couple of weeks, following the increase of military actions between the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip and Israel. Incidents of anti-Semitism have occurred in the context of protests against Israeli actions in countries that include the United States, Canada, which is pictured here on the left, 
Britain, Belgium, Twitter, and, or sorry, Bel Twitter's not its own country yet, <laughs> Germany, Belgium, and elsewhere. And we even have Holocaust survivors being targeted on Twitter and TikTok, as indicated on the right. In other cases, the presence of anti-Semitism through anti-Israel critique is less obvious. And in these cases, the IRA definition advises taking into consideration the overall context. In short, investigate further. Because as I said a moment ago, the IRA definition it can only shine a light on areas we might miss. It's not a perfect tool, but it is a significant step forward. Let's move to another example, stereotypes. Now, we're all familiar with hateful stereotypes and why they're a problem. What about seemingly positive stereotypes? A lot of us assume there's nothing wrong with these, but let's interrogate this a bit further. Take into consideration philo-Semitic, pro-Jewish stereotypes for a moment. These can show that positive stereotypes are merely the flip side of an already damaged coin. Philo-Semitism can appear in strange ways. Take, for example, the lucky Jew icon on the top left. You can still buy these today in many shops in parts of Eastern Europe. And notionally, you buy this icon because you can put a coin in its hand and it'll make you magically rich. It's built on the supposition that all Jews are good with money. Seemingly harmless, but built on belief in a false conspiracy that does real harm. Let's leave Europe behind and go to Japan for a moment. To the right of the figure is the Japanese version of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which I mentioned earlier. This book became popular in Japan, not because Jews were seen in a negative light, but because they were seen in a positive way. The short version is the early 20th century Japanese experience with Jews seemed to affirm that Jews, at least in the minds of some Japanese, that Jews were able to pull a number of political and financial strengths. And there was a historical reason for this. A Jewish banker in New York, Jacob Schiff, helped float bonds on the stock market that in turn helped Japan afford to win its war against Russia in the early part of the 20th century. This experience made the protocol somewhat popular, but exposure to these tracks led to occasional flare-ups of anti-Semitism in East Asia and the use of anti-Semitic biases against non-Japanese people in the region. Now, the Japanese have moved past their engagement with this book, but Chinese colleagues have told me that some business leaders in that country are still known to refer to the uh, protocols positively for today. Now, there are more examples, of course, but as I said earlier, the definition's only a starting point. It doesn't answer every question, but it can complement other approaches and establish a foundation for learning about and responding to anti-Semitism. Now, with our remaining time, and assuming the storm doesn't knock out my internet, I want to hone in on two particular challenges to countering anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial and Holocaust distortion. Holocaust denial seeks to convince people that the Holocaust and occasionally related atrocities did not take place. In doing so, Holocaust deniers are just trying to make anti-Semitism acceptable or to provide legitimacy for Nazism. Denial is anti-Semitism, and it's a significant problem, but it's considerably less common, at least in our parts of the world these days, than the related phenomenon of Holocaust distortion. At the simplest level, Holocaust distortion excuses, minimizes, or misrepresents the Holocaust and its relevance. Holocaust distortion is tricky because distortion does not deny the reality of the Holocaust per se. It's also difficult to identify the motives behind distortion. Is somebody distorting because they're cynical and anti-Semitic? Or are they doing it because they just don't know the facts? Regardless, allowing for or excusing Holocaust distortion erodes our understanding of and respect for the subject. On a moral level, it's an insult to the memories of the victims and survivors. And on a practical level, it can act as a, as a gateway drug, if you will, to conspiracy theory, Holocaust denial, and more dangerous forms of anti-Semitism. So let's go through a few of these forms. Some of the original forms of distortion and denial would play havoc with Holocaust history. These false claims were often more than, more than often than not easy enough to counter with historical facts and archival documentation. We also see regular attempts to excuse or minimize the relevance of the Holocaust. For example, in some of the countries where the Holocaust took place, 
you'll see suggestions that the Holocaust is not an important part of national history or that locals did not play a role in crimes against Jews. And occasionally one still sees attempts to make the Holocaust somehow humorous or to suggest that it had positive aspects. Blaming Jews for the Holocaust, this is shocking, right? Well, this form of victim blaming variously claims that Jewish responses to the rise of Nazism or that partial Jewish participation in certain political movements somehow justified their persecution. These are forms of distortion because they're not only historically inaccurate, they also lessen the burden of guilt on perpetrators and suggest that there was some rationale behind this mass genocide. At times, there are those who suggest that something in the supposedly Jewish character, older anti-Semitic themes led to the Holocaust. In parts of Eastern Europe, you might encounter offhand references to something called Judeo-communism. That is a misbelief that Jews were overwhelmingly communist. In essence, a coded suggestion that the Holocaust was just an anti-communist action. Either way, it's an unacceptable form of bait and switch that opens the door to more anti-Semitism. Now, state-sponsored distortion is something we see all too often, and sometimes it can be rather innocuous, like when a governmental museum presents imagery from the Nazi era without any historical context, but it can also be a bit more overt. Take this billboard, which appeared in Crimea right before it was taken over by the Russian Federation in 2014. It suggests essentially that Crimeans had two choices, rule by Nazis in a less than subtle reference to Ukraine or peace under the Russian Federation. Now, is this anti-Semitic? Possibly not, but it certainly links to anti-Semitic imagery and makes a mess out of respect for the Holocaust as a, as a subject and a historical reality. And there are also attempts even today to honor people or organizations whose actions or words led to the Holocaust. And by this, I don't mean only the infamous Lukov marches that happened in Bulgaria or parades in honor of SS veterans in Latvia. I'm talking about a bigger problem, one that plagues countries that were occupied by the Nazis, countries that were neutral during the war, and countries that were on our side, the alliance, including in the United States. This is a shared problem. So let me dive into this briefly. At times, the so-called rehabilitated have benefit from official processes, like when a high court overturns a long past judicial sentence. The picture on the top left here, actually the individual standing on the left is uh, Leon Rupnik, or was Leon Rupnik rather. Rupnik um, had his uh, death sentence overturned in January of 2020 by the Slovenian Supreme Court. Never mind the fact that he was tried and hanged in 1946. His decision was overturned on a technicality, which opens the door for him to be seen, at least by some, as a hero by uh, elements in that country. Now, other times, parliaments have taken official action before the courts can even get involved. This is something that we've seen in countries like Lithuania or Ukraine. The picture in the middle, the bust that's surrounded by grass in the background. Well, that is Roman Shukevich. Shukevich was a head of something called the Ukrainian Insurgent Army. And he was not only a Nazi collaborator who's complicit in crimes against Jews, but he was also complicit in crimes against approximately 90,000 ethnic Poles who were murdered in what is now uh, Eastern, or sorry, Western Ukraine. There's also persons who had their reputations rehabilitated because they were well-known cultural luminaries or authors. Others are venerated by religious authorities, primarily Orthodox Christian and Roman Catholic uh, churches, and any time religion gets involved, it complicates matters, to say the least. And some have escaped justice entirely, going on to other forms of acclaim. To this list, we need to include some of the Nazi scientists brought to the United States to work on our rocket programs. Some of these uh, individuals were in the SS and oversaw programs that used Jewish slave labor during the war. As I said, this is a shared problem, and nobody walks away clean. Now, another form is the use of Holocaust-related symbols. This is somewhat obvious, right? For example, here we have the flag of Greece's Golden Dawn Party. Its party flag is a bit on the nose, but what about these? Most of us might see something problematic in the flag of the All-German Heathens Front, a neo-Nazi organization with branches across Northern Europe. 
And if you know that flag, you might be able to recognize something awry in the flag of the Nordic resistance movement, a different neo-Nazi band in Scandinavian countries. What about this? Here we have a group of American white nationalists, some of whom were involved in the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally. They're holding the flag of the Romanian Iron Guard, the anti-Semitic and fascist party of Romania that, was in power, that existed between 1927 and 1941. To know why this is a hate symbol, you have to have a deeper knowledge base to draw upon. And sometimes symbols can be hidden. So here we have a flag that popped up at a Legia Warsaw soccer game. Now, the shield in the center is fine. That's on the team uniform. I'm drawing your attention to those triangles in the background. Those aren't part of the team kit. Those are so-called Gibor runes, or a Wolfsangel, a symbol that was used by some Nazi SS detachments in the 1940s. So what do we do? Well, in some countries, it's possible to restrict harmful speech, but this is not something we can consider in the US for good reasons related to our approach to freedoms of speech. And it's also worth noting that even at the broad level of international human rights law, there's no exact or agreed upon definition of hate speech. And even under the terms of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, everyone has a right to freedom of opinion and expression. That said, let's go back to Europe, because in some European approaches have allowed for at least the hypothetical application of measures to address anti-Semitism as a threat to public order that is in keeping with the EU understanding of acceptable speech, standards that are more stringent than our own. Consider so-called Holocaust denial laws. Now, these measures have their origins in some of the anti-fascist laws that we, put in, we, the United States, put in place in post-war Austria and West Germany. But the first real Holocaust denial laws didn't pop up until 1990, the first being in France. And it criminalized denial of the Holocaust or the glorification of war crimes, crimes against humanity, or collaboration with the enemy. This French law became a standard for regulations that appeared across Europe and which have been affirmed by, among other bodies, the European Court of Human Rights. But do these laws work? Do they limit hate speech, forms of anti-Semitism, or Holocaust denial? Honestly, the data is not there, at least not yet. And there's a tension between those original Holocaust denial laws that were established to protect fact and, and new variants of these laws, which are protecting interpretations of history or historical narratives. This is something that became clear after the Russian Federation passed something called the Yaravaya Law in 2014, which forbade denial of Second World War crimes and also effectively any mention of Nazi crimes from that era including the fact that the Soviets had a pact with the Nazis that allowed for the partition of Poland, at least until the Nazis declared war on the Soviet Union in 1941. For mentioning this pact, a Russia jailed a blogger from the city of Perm. And similar laws are now appearing in other European countries, including in some EU member states. When, we should also note that existing laws also connect to efforts to combat neo-Nazism in certain ways or to hate speech regulations, but it becomes very complicated. And as I said, we don't know if they actually work. So another option is calling for the improvement of the tracking of hate crimes. You need to know the scale of a problem in order to know how to respond. As I mentioned earlier though, there are some communities that don't have good relationships with the police. And there are some police districts that seem reluctant to report these crimes. Plus there's the very real fact that reporting standards differ from country to country. Nevertheless, we need to push forward. With that said, let's bring this home. Things are dire, but there are also signs of progress. First among these governments, including our own, are talking about these issues and are working with us to identify solutions. So here are a few suggestions on how to respond. First, we need to enhance educational opportunities to learn and not just about the Holocaust, although the Holocaust is an essential component of what I'm suggesting. We also need to learn about the wider range of Jewish experiences and the ways that Jewish communities have contributed to our politics, our culture, and our societies. It's shamefully all too common to hear educators in the United States and abroad refer to events like the Holocaust as Jewish history instead of something that's part of our shared past. If we don't reconnect our common experiences, that void will continue to be filled 
by imagined communities built on separation and tension instead of harmony. And as we integrate learning about our shared history, we need to go beyond just the secondary school level. Secondary education is an essential foundation. There's no denying that. But we have to continue to engage with the Holocaust, with anti-Semitism, and with related topics in our universities, our trade schools, professional education courses, and in the training of our civil servants. Political responsibility is also essential. As hinted at earlier, anti-Semitism and the Holocaust are topics that are often misused for all manner of political, cultural, or ideological gain. Societies and governments, and frankly, all of us, need to speak out against such, such misuse and not allow anti-Semitism or the Holocaust to become weapons that one political opponent uses cynically against another. New media. Well, there's been a lot of talk about social media companies and their responsibility to tackle online hate. And this is good, but it's only half the equation. What is our responsibility? We use these platforms after all. We need to figure out better ways to communicate against anti-Semitism because frankly speaking, those who so hate, be they from the right, from the left, or from religious extremist groups, are much better at reaching vulnerable communities like the economically depressed or the young than we are. Finally, we need to develop opportunities for regular and constructive dialogue between like-minded causes and like-minded institutions on these issues. And we need to support the development of sustainable institutions like museums that can push back against attempts to make use of this history or to spread anti-Semitism. If we don't do this, we're going, to continue, we're going to continue to fall into decline. Now, there are multiple resources available that can help educators and policymakers who seek to alleviate anti-Semitism. These resources have been established by intergovernmental bodies like the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, as well as resources created by museums and memorials around the world. I'm happy to discuss these during the Q&A. But as we conclude, I want you to remember that anti-Semitism is a growing problem. More than that, the conditions of the moment make it a major threat to civil peace and to our democracies. We need to fight back, but we have to do so in an informed and strategic manner. We need to understand anti-Semitism, how it appears, how it manifests, and how it becomes part of the thinking of vulnerable groups and our fellow citizens. And for this, we need continued dialogue and quite honestly, some humility. But we need to begin moving forward now, and we have to do so together. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, that was a lot of information, um, very helpful. And I'm pulling up the questions that are already waiting for you. And as you just said that you would be happy to discuss resources, I do have several questions about that. So um, it's kind of two parts. Uh, what resources can people turn to to combat Holocaust denial and distortion uh, separately from what resources or are there particular resources um, for um, learning about contemporary anti-Semitism and, and uh, finding ways to combat it? Okay, I just wanted, wanted to make, write down a few so I don't forget them. Uh, fortunately, there are a number of resources. I mentioned in my closing comments, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. Uh, OSCE's Human Rights Branch has had a program for the last, oh wow, when did we first start working on it? Like five years ago, last five years called Words into Action. Words into Action has a whole suite of materials for A, policymakers who, wants, who want to institute policies to teach about anti-Semitism so students can recognize and respond to it. But for educators in particular, and I know we have a lot of teachers in the audience tonight, they also created 10 excellent curricula for teaching about anti-Semitism in different ways. Some of these curricula deal with topics like conspiracy theories, uh, like Holocaust denial, and, and elements uh, included therein. Um, I'll, I'll go. To, I'll start with the intergovernmental bodies, then I'll come back to the smaller, the smaller organizations. Or then uh, we have um, in January of this year or December of last year. I can't remember when it was launched. 
The uh, European Union launched a handbook for the practical uh, implementation of the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism. That's online. That handbook in its introductory section uh, outlines very clearly how to understand these examples with real world, real world cases. Uh, so that's very useful. Uh, the German government has created something called the Global Task Force on Holocaust Distortion. We just launched a report. I'm one of two experts on the steering committee for that body. Uh, the only non-German, I think, actually. Oh, no, there's an Austrian. Um, they have a, uh, a handbook on understanding forms of distortion and a number of recommendations uh, for governments to implement there. There are also major museums and small museums that have a number of resources that are available to you. My home institution, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, has, in addition to its very large encyclopedia of the Holocaust, a number of learning modules that are available online that deal with denial and distortion and with uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, institutions like the Holocaust Museum Houston also have online resources. And depending on where you are in the country, I would recommend you go to the website of the Association of Holocaust Organizations. They will give you a list of local Holocaust institutions that will have more resources available for you. So fortunately, there are materials out there the trick, of course, is making certain that people, A, use those materials, and B, that those materials are constantly being updated for new learning environments. And that's, that's a huge challenge. Thank you. Uh, we have several questions about confronting anti-Semitism on a personal level. So how, what recommendations do you have for responding to anti-Semitism from a friend, a family member? And another question came in about um, a college student who's confronting anti-Semitism in their social media and on their campus. I'll start with the easier one, believe it or not, which is the college student. Um, although that is a growing concern in parts of North America and the UK, uh, the issue of anti-Semitism on campus, uh, there are fortunately uh, some avenues that can be explored to deal with cases of campus anti-Semitism. The US Department of Education issued something called a Dear Colleague letter in 2010 that extended uh, Civil Rights Act protections to Jewish students on campus. And the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education, I believe, can explore these issues. So I would advise going to the Department of Education's website and, and determining the best way to deal with that. You can also, of course, work through your own university structure to deal with these things because there are structures in place to deal with issues like harassment and bias and, and, and other issues. The challenge, of course, is making people aware that anti-Semitism is a form of bias. It's something that's unfortunately often discounted depending on, on the location. How to respond on the personal level is very, very difficult. Um, I hate to give a negative example, but it's something I just happened to see in the press today. Yesterday on a train in Austria, uh, a man overheard two people denying the Holocaust. He confronted them with this and he was beaten. Uh, so it's not always safe to do so. Obviously, if you have a personal relationship with somebody, preferably an amicable relationship with that person, it's easier to have a conversation off to the side, but not in front of them and say, and ask the question that I asked in my presentation. Do you know that might be anti-Semitic? Let's talk about it. You know, but you want to, you don't want to do it in an accusatory way. You, you really do want to pose it as a question because posing it as a question, A, lowers a person's guard. And if you wag your finger at somebody, they're immediately going to erect a wall. They're not going to listen to you. But most of us have made mistakes in the past, right? You know, I mean, I, I had a son that used to like to point out every heavyset person uh, when he was a toddler. You can correct those sorts of behaviors, but it's, it is difficult. I, I'd be lying if I said it was easy. It, it requires a certain degree of courage, but frankly, we need courage at this moment. Uh, there's a few questions about the correlation of anti-Zionism to anti-Semitism. Could you speak to that? Sure, it's complex, actually. I mean, let's leave aside certain rabbinical arguments against uh, Zionism because I think that's a different case entirely. 
But what we have seen uh, oftentimes is that critique that claims to be anti-Zionist is in fact anti-Semitic. It, like the case of in Wuppertal, right? Were the Jewish diaspora is conflated with the actions of the state of Israel, which leads to forms of anti-Semitism, you know, emerging themselves, uh, coming out. And we often see that through what people claim to be anti-Zionist critique. It also includes things like calling for the destruction of, of the state of Israel. I mean, the state of Israel is a Jewish collective. If you're calling for the destruction of a Jewish collective, you're engaging in an anti-Semitic form of rhetoric. The trick, the challenge is, again, it's, it's, it's surfacing this. I think some people do this self-consciously, so are they self-consciously making anti-Semitic statements? And I think other times, quite honestly, you have people engaging in forms of anti-Semitism without always being aware of it. I think that's the audience that you need to focus on. Focus on people who really don't know what they're talking about, who are just reacting. And if you explain the factual dynamics to them, I've seen this, I've done this with, with, uh, well, with student groups before, a, a switch turns and things be, begin to, they begin to be more cautious. So it's, but it's very, very complex. Okay, coming back to social media, um, have social media companies like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter improved their responses to anti-Semitism? Many people have expressed frustration that these posts, these anti-Semitic posts were not being taken down or addressed quickly enough. Well, that's a very big question. It depends on the platform. Um, so the, I'll stick with, with some of the platforms that I know best. I think at times, Twitter's done a, a good job of responding when they've been alerted to cases of anti-Semitism um, or when communities take action against anti-Semitism on their platform about, was it during the pandemic? Well, I think it was during the pandemic. About a year ago, a rapper in the UK made a number of anti-Semitic remarks. So, uh, significant number of uh, people in the Jewish community of Great Britain and allies around the world logged out of Twitter for the day. And that seemed to have forced that company to take some positive action in that regard. I know there are some companies like Google YouTube that are very eager to learn about cases of anti-Semitism and trends in online anti-Semitism so that they can change their algorithms in, way, in order to react. Um, whether things have improved or not, though, is a difficult question to answer because at the same time that certain companies are taking action to deplatform extremists or to remove anti-Semitism from uh, their social media channels, the rates at which anti-Semitism appears are increasing. So you have more content coming in while they're taking action, and that content is being covered in different ways. So it's kind of like a snake swallowing its own tail. It's really hard to get ahead of it, uh, ahead of the problem. But I do know that there are a few companies that are earnestly trying to, to deal with this. And then there are, on the other hand, and it's worth noting, while there are some companies that, so we'll call them some mainstream social media companies trying to deal with this issue, there are more and more, I guess we could call them fringe social media outlets popping up to replace the forums under which haters used to act. So uh, you have forums like Parler or Gab, uh, certain subreddits uh, that you know, just become a cesspit for, for hateful content. Are there any local governments or states that have taken action to address anti-Semitism through laws or policies? I, yeah, I'm definitely not an expert on the United States. So with that caveat, my understanding is that there are a few states, um, I think a couple of mid-Atlantic states, I believe the state of Florida, I believe the state of Texas, um, and others who have tried to take action to deal with anti-Semitism in various ways. How effective those are, I'm not sure. I do know that I hate to say my home state of Kentucky again, but you know my home state of Kentucky did adopt the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism to guide its practice and understanding of anti-Semitism. They did that about three months ago, if I'm not mistaken, relatively recently. Uh, going back to conspiracy theories and QAnon, um, 
given uh, your studies on this, would you say that it is uh, QAnon is still growing in popularity and in, in numbers, or is there evidence of a decline? I'm not sure, actually. I mean, now that it has exported uh, around the world, you know, the, the dynamics are changing a little bit. Uh, the, the core myths that inform QAnon, I think, are under transition. I think the events on January 6th made people question the validity of that conspiracy myth in our midst. But January 6th was only four months ago. I think it's too early to say for sure. You know, it is certainly something that we continue to see popping up. It popped up in a number of, um, there were actually several protests in Berlin over the last weekend uh, where Q propaganda was seen. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I hope it disappears, but I fear that it will not, uh, at least not in the near future. I will say, however, as disturbing and destructive as the QAnon myth is, I think in some ways, because there are certain outlandish aspects of it, um, it is perhaps less of a threat than other anti-Semitic conspiracy myths. The foremost of among the new ones, the great replacement myth. I think we see that popping up across Europe and certain parts of the United States. And that's one that can really lead to, to some real violence. Um. The next one's a, a spelling question. Uh, recently, uh, there's been a change in how the word anti-Semitism is spelled. Is it uh, in the past with a hyphen between anti and Semitism? And now uh, it is more widely uh, used as just one word, anti-Semitism. So would, would you explain that to our audience? Sure. Yes, um, I'll, I'll explain that as quickly as I can. And I should note, that, um, actually, that my predecessor is chair of the Anti-Semitism Committee at, at the IRA, uh, a man named Mark Weitzman. Uh, he, uh, he was behind a campaign that to, to get the first the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance to endorse that definition and then to have it normalized through other media, I think beginning with Microsoft and most recently AP. So. This is an older academic debate. It's at least 30 or so years old. And it's based on the factual understanding that there is no such thing as a Semitic people, right? There are Semitic languages, right? Aramaic, Hebrew, Arabic, so on and so forth. But there are no Semitic peoples. Um, the concept of anti Semitism or anti Semitismus is something that was invented in late 19th century Germany on this false assumption that there were Semitic peoples. So the thinking is that if you put the hyphen between anti and Semitism, that you are somehow giving credence to the notion that there is such a thing as Semitism. By removing the hyphen, you take some power away from the word. Now, there is a, there is a debate, I, I'm not sure how necessary it really is, about whether we use with the hyphen, without the hyphen, or if we get rid of the word anti-Semitism entirely and call it anti-Jewish hate or you know, Judeophobia, or it's a whole plethora of, of words. At the end of the day, I think anti-Semitism is the word, no matter how it's spelled, that most people recognize as hatred being directed toward Jewish people. So we need to stick with the word because you know, it's the word that provokes a reaction. Hopefully it's a reaction against it. Um, I think these debates, however, whether it's a debate about how you define anti-Semitism or how you dispel anti-Semitism, how do I put, the, I'm not going to put this gently. These debates are a distraction from the fact that we have real world problems. People are being targeted, people are being uh, uh, insulted, killed, or threatened. And, you know, debating a, the spelling of something or debating the definition of something is the last thing we need. That's a luxury that we have at a time that's not in crisis. And unfortunately, this is a time that's largely at crisis. Thank you. Uh, some people are making the connection between a rise in anti-Semitism and a rise of authoritarianism. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that for a moment. Yes, I think that's clear that uh, anytime you have an authoritarian government or an attempt to undermine uh, what we'll say are, are liberal, small L democratic norms, you have a concomitant rise in anti Semitism. And it doesn't matter if that authoritarian regime 
is to the left or to the right. I mean, let's not forget the Soviet Union was very anti-Semitic in its official policies after 1948. You can have it on the left just as much as you have it on, on, in a right-wing regime. And why does this happen? Well, the simplest answer is scapegoating. You know, anti-Semitism is known as the longest hatred because it has been around for at least 2000 years, although there are some scholars that'll take it to the fall of Babylon, but let's say with the foundation of the Church of Rome. And as a result, it becomes an easy go-to excuse, at least in the Western world, which I mean, well, it's not just the Western world, I guess we'll call it the, the world touched by Europe. Uh, so Europe itself, Australia, <laughs> New Zealand, and North America, and parts of Latin America as well. So, you know, it becomes the go-to scapegoat to explain problems, you know, the, the consummate outsider. But it's not always just Jews who are targeted. You know, we see the targeting in certain European countries of Roma communities, the, the, we used to call them gypsies, but of Romani communities, of Muslim communities, of any outside community at the same time or after the targeting of Jewish communities. They, they kind, of, kind of go hand in hand. There's an element to which anti-Semitism is a canary in the coal mine for other forms of hatred. I think we have time for one last question. Um, so would you tell us a little bit more about the work being done at the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance um, and the USHMM through international affairs? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'll summarize without going, you know, point by point into program by program. Um, I'll summarize it this way. Anti-Semitism is a global issue. It is something that we're seeing rise in the United States, but, you know, the United States does not exist under a bell jar. For that matter, Europe or individual European countries don't exist under a bell jar. We have the rise of extremisms across the ideological spectrum that also occur across borders. Online groups, best example of it, a 14-year-old kid in Estonia a number of years ago created a far-right neo-Nazi network that had adherents that lived across the Baltic states, uh, Scandinavia, parts of Germany, the Netherlands, and the United States, right? The, why do I mention this? Because the international work of organizations like the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and my home institution, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and other bodies is necessary because anti-Semitism is an international problem. If we treat it like something that is just a domestic concern, we're going to miss the forest for the trees. So we need to, and what we engage in are developing partnerships and shared programs to tackle anti-Semitism in a variety of its forms. But like, you know, how do I put this without making it seem like we're involved in covert action? Because we're not, but these aren't, these aren't public programs more often than not. Usually they are behind the scenes discussions working with partnerships to develop resources like the EU handbook on uh, the IRA definition or like the work of this global task force. You know, but they have to be built on partnerships because there are international perspectives that differ from our own. We don't always have the right, the right answer to every problem and uh, neither do our partners. So we're seeing fortunately more and more partnered initiatives to tackle this issue. And I'm hoping that will yield some results over time. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, certainly very timely given um, the state of anti-Semitism in the world today. Thank you to our guests for joining us this evening. And we hope that you will join us again on June 8th for the Gerald S. Kaplan Endowed Lecture with Dr. Benjamin Carter Hatt, who will discuss the Nazi menace at home and abroad. Uh, to register for this free virtual lecture, go to our website, hmh.org. Thank you again, and good evening.